good morning one and all uh, it is a delight to speak to such a uh, such a group of enthusiastic ophthalmologists with special interest in steven johnson syndrome and i should thank dr vikas for giving me this opportunity so i would be covering my talk on acute uh, sjs in two parts first part i would be dealing with the clinical assessment including the clinical details of acute sjs and the second part would mainly focus on the management of acute sjs from the dermatological perspective and i would be happy to take questions at the end of the end of my talk especially since since uh, since you are not a dermatologist or audience you might be having many doubts on how we see how we manage you can discuss all of it at the end of the of my talk uh, so this is how patients generally present to us when they when they when they come to our hospital so what you can see is there is a diffuse rash and there is severe mucositis so uh, to diagnose sjs one has to concentrate on the morphology of the rash because for non dermatologist all rash are the same but for a dermatologist each rash is different so to diagnose a skin rash one has to concentrate on its morphology and specially to diagnose sjs tn or erythema multiforme one has to be one has to be aware of the target lesion so you can see two photographs here one on my left has a different morphology and one on my right has a different morphology so the one on my right shows three zones there is a central dusky discoloration surrounded by a zone of pallor surrounded by a zone of erythema so this is a typical lesion of erythema multiforme or a typical target lesion whereas one on my left shows a similar looking lesion but there is a subtle difference so there is just two zones so compared to the lesion here there are three zones the first zone the second zone and the third zone whereas here there are just two zones there is one zone here surrounded by erythema that is the middle zone of pallor is missing so this is what is known as an atypical target lesion so any patient who has an atypical target lesion has a drug rash so at least for an ophthalmologist you can assume that any patient with an atypical target lesion has a drug rash so uh, then again the spectrum of the drug rash varies so in in milder disease when when it is erythema multiforme you see typical target lesions and in sjs you see just 10% of the body involved and in sjs tn it's 30% body involvement and more than 30% is tn so what do the patients clinically present as initially patient tells that they had fever coryza upper respiratory tract infection like symptoms followed by that they de they develop diffused erythema and burning sensation in the skin and and together with this rash they also notice ocular complaints they tell that their eyes eyes became red there is congestion in their eyes then there was erosion there was increased watering so patients then develop skin lesions in the form of targetoid skin lesions which eventually progress to skin peeling and this is invariably associated with mucosal involvement generally these patients have multiple mucosal involvement there is involvement of uh, ocular mucosa there is involvement of oral mucosa and there is also involvement of genital and anal mucosa so basically for a non dermatologist the patient comes with a skin rash and mucosal involvement so what are the differential diagnosis of a skin rash and mucosal involvement which can mimic sjstn so it is staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome toxic shock syndrome pemphigus vulgaris bullous pemphigoid generalized fixed drug eruption graft versus host disease and drug rash eosinophilia and systemic symptoms so this is a very uh, exhaustive table so i'll come back to this table again after showing you some clinical photographs so basically we can differentiate these dif uh, differential diagnosis based on characteristic characteristic morphology and involvement of the oral and the ocular mucosa most often at least as clinicians you need not have to concentrate on the histopathology but there are specific histopathological features also for sjstn it is always atypical targetoid lesions the the photo which was to my left so they show two zones and purpuric macules whereas for staphylococcus scarlet skin syndrome such atypical targetoid lesions are not present 
So atypical target out lesions is a drug rash and most probably it is SJSTN. And in toxic shock syndrome, there is exfoliative erythema, there is no peeling of skin and there is some mucositis. In pemphigus vulgaris, the background skin is normal. There is just flaccid bulle and the peeling of skin is limited to the bulle and in and around the bulle. In bullous pemphigus, there are tense blisters on a background of an erythematous or an urticarial skin. And in fixed drug eruptions, there is generally an history that there is recurrent blisters which develop at the same spot. New sites can get involved eventually, but the older sites will invariably get involved. Any patients who present with recurrent drug rash has FTE. And dress, it, it's a constellation of symptoms and signs. Generally, clinically, the patients present with exfoliative rash, severe facial edema, chelitis would be there, but the characteristic hemorrhagic crusting, which is seen in SJSTN, is most probably not there in any of the other differential diagnoses. So I'll be showing some, some clinical photographs, which are my collection, uh, on, on these differentials and show you the clinical pointers towards diagnosing or differentiating SJSTN from, from other diseases. So if you can recall the photo which I had shown previously, the patients of SJSTN invariably showed purpuric macules, that is uh, purplish red pigmented macules and target odd lesions. Whereas these patients, this is a patient of Staphylococcus scarlet skin syndrome, that is not seen. What you can appreciate is diffuse erythema and there is peeling of skin. And this peeling of skin is accentuated over the flexures. And generally, Staphylococcus scarlet skin syndrome affects children. They are generally less than 5 year old. And adults are rarely uh, affected with this disease. And if, if, if adults are affected, they generally have a renal compromise because the Staphylococcus toxin is not excreted and then they develop Staphylococcus scarlet skin syndrome. Uh, this is toxic shock syndrome. Again, uh, it is common in uh, adult females, especially menstrual menstruation associated, though it is uh, not commonly seen nowadays. But we, can, we do come across adults with toxic shock syndrome. So what you can appreciate here is there is diffuse exfoliative rash, there is diffuse erythema, there is, uh, there is, uh, the skin is being shed in scales, but there is no erosion. The underlying skin does, is not raw as what you see in SJSTN. Here also you can see some, some atypical target odd lesions occasionally, but there is no raw surface at, as to what you see in SJSTN. This is a patient, this is a child with pemphigus vulgaris. Here also you can see that there is extensive erosions, but see his eyes, they are spared. And see his lips, there is no hemorrhagic crusting. So in SJSTN, you invariably have hemorrhagic crusting of the lips. Whereas in other differentials, probably other than Kawasaki, you will never see such, such, such prominent chelitis and hemorrhagic crusting. Uh, this, is, this was a case, patient of paraneoplastic pemphigus. So this is a, this is a subtype of pemphigus where, where there is associated, which is associated with malignancy. These patients can have chelitis and hemorrhagic crusting of the lips and ocular involvement. And this can closely mimic, mimic SJSTN. But they invariably have a chronic course unlike SJS. And again, you don't see atypical target odd lesions. So atypical target odd lesions is SJS. So this is bullous pemphigot. What you can appreciate is that there is a background erythema or an articarial base and there are tense blisters. Again, there is no atypical target odd lesions. Uh, this, this photograph I added to compare with the previous photo. What you can see here is a background erythema and urticaria, but there is no EM-like lesions or atypical target odd lesions. Whereas in this photograph, there are atypical target odd lesions. So there is central dusky lesion surrounded by erythema and you can see small pustules and tense blisters. This is drug-induced bullous pemphigot. So if it is a drug-induced etiology, invariably you see EM-like lesions or target odd lesions. Uh, this was a patient of mucous membrane pemphigot. This, uh, this is commonly ophthalmologists do come across ocular cicatricial pemphigod and in chronic stages it can mimic uh, SJSTN. So they have tense blisters again. You don't see uh, peeling of skin or, or, uh, or purpuric macules or target odd lesions. 
there is conjectival scarring features of cicatricial uh, cicatrizations are there but acute involvement is generally not present so this is a patient of fixed drug eruption again there is involvement of the lips but it is not involved diffusely there is just localized involvement there is one lesion here then there is sparing of the mucosa then there is one lesion here and acral parts are typically involved with tense blisters and it is invariably recurrent. So, if you can actually appreciate, this is a healed lesion. So, the patient had had FT fixed drug eruption previously, he again took the medicine and again he has developed FTE. This is a patient with acute graft versus host disease. So, he was a case patient of AML has undergone hematogenous uh, transplantation and after that he has developed an an exfoliative rash. So, there is diffuse erythematous rash involving typically the face, the, the ear lobules would be involved, the palms and soles would be involved, but again you do not see a typical target ordinations. This is a patient of, patient of chronic graft versus host disease. So, there are there is psoriasiform rash, there is no peeling of skin, there is no atypical target ordinations. So, this is, this is one more uh, uh, drug rash which can closely mimic, uh, mimic uh, Steven Johnson syndrome. So, this is drug rash, eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. Here you have a typical target odd lesion. So, you can appreciate there are dusky lesions here. There is central necrosis surrounded by a zone of edema. There is severe facial edema. There is chelitis and it is a constellation of symptoms and signs. So, there is exfoliative erythema you can appreciate here there is diffuse erythema the skin is exfoliating there is em like rash and these patients invariably have transaminitis and nephritis so this is an adult patient with dress so there is diffuse facial edema there is an exfoliative rash and there were some quires with sjs without skin involvement when just the mucosa is involved so, I will be showing a photograph at the end where, where, where the patient has a long term sequelae of SJS and still show you the clinical pointers towards, towards a previous uh, episode of SJS. So, SJS without skin involvement is rare, but it is a distinct subset which represents mycoplasma associated mucositis. It is common in children and adolescents and it is better known as Fuse syndrome. So, this photograph I took it from uh, New England Journal of Medicine. So, this patient had mycoplasma pneumonia, had severe mucositis. The uh, generally even in, in mycoplasma associated mucositis or if there is just mucosal involvement, invariably other mucosas are involved other than the ocular mucosa. They will have oral mucosal involvement, they will have genital mucosal involvement. So, ocular involvement in isolation if it is there then it is probably not Steven Johnson syndrome. And also in erythema multiforme spectrum of disease, especially in erythema multiforme major, the patients can have just subtle EM like lesions on the acral part, especially palms and soles. So, if you do not examine the palms and soles or if the patient might have such severe mucositis that he might not have noticed such lesions on, in palms and soles, so he or she might tell that he, he never had any skin lesions. But invariably these patients have multiple mucosal involvement, just isolated uh, ocular involvement is most likely not, will not happen in SJS. So, I have come back to this table again after going through the clinical photographs. So, uh, the, one, the pointers which are highlighted in red are probably specific for the diagnosis of these diseases. So, the patient of SJS and TN has atypical targetoid lesions. They have hemorrhagic crusting of the lips and on histopathology they show pandermal keratinocyte necrosis. In staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, there is sheet like peeling of skin, there is no target odd lesions, the mucosa is spared, there is no involvement of the oral mucosa and histopathology does not show epidermal necrosis. In toxic shock syndrome, invariably patient comes with shock, there is systemic symptoms, there is an exfoliative rash, chelitis may be present, but there is no atypical target odd lesions. In pemphigus vulgaris, there are flaccid blisters, there is oral mucosal erosion also, but hemorrhagic crusting and chelitis is not a feature and on histopathology and immunofluorescence, they are diagnostic to, uh, for pemphigus vulgaris. In bullous pemphigod and mucous membrane pemphigod, there are tense blisters. Generally, atypical target odd lesions are not seen, 
and the, you see immune deposits in the basement membrane zone. In fixed drug eruption, there, are, there is history of recurrent tense blisters. Recurrent is the catch point here. And in dress, the severe facial edema is typ typically characteristic. So, how do we manage these patients? So, as soon as the patients come to us, it is, it is necessary that you establish the spectrum of the disease to which they belong. So, this is the, uh, this is the mostly widely ex ex accepted bastucci garin classification of the erythema multiforme SJS 10 spectrum. So, bullous erythema multiforme has typical target lesions. The photograph which I showed to my right, which had three zones and they have typical target lesions. The extent of involvement is 10 percent. These, these uh, target or lesions predominantly involve the acral parts and the face. The rest of the body can be spared. And mucosal involvement is mostly present, generally more than one mucosa is involved. In Steven Johnson syndrome, you see atypical target lesions and purpuric macules. Skin peeling may be present, but the extent of involvement is less than 10 percent. And again, mucosal involvement is quite common. In SJSTN spectrum, you see atypical target out lesions and purpuric macules, but the extent of involvement is more. There is involvement of 10 to 30 percent of body surface area, and in 10 width spots, the involvement is more than 30 percent of body surface area. Then we are prognostically assess what, what would be the likely outcome of this patient. So, the widely accepted severity assessment scale is the score 10. So, there are seven parameters in score 10 which should be done as soon as the patient is seen in emergency and again to be repeated after, after 72 hours. Age less more than 40 years scores 1, associated mal malignancy scores 1, heart rate of more than 120 again scores 1 and blood urea nitrogen more than 28, involvement of body surface area more than 10 percent, serum bicarbonate less than 20 percent and serum glucose more, more than 252. In, in my practice, what I have noticed is the most important prognostic factor for, to predict the outcome of the patient is age. The higher the age, it is less likely that the outcome would be poor. The second important prognostic factor is associated malignancy. Patients who develop uh, uh, TEN post chemotherapy generally do not make. And the third important uh, prognostic factor is serum BUN. So, any patient who have uh, acute uh, uh, kidney injury, especially uh, acute tubular necrosis because of dehydration that does have a very bad outcome. So, the, the score also predicts the mortality rate. Any patient who has a score of 1 has negligible mortality, whereas a patient of score 4 or 5 has nearly 50 percent chance that they, or they would not make it. So, as I told before, there are among these seven uh, 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 risk factors in score 10, the three important one are the age associated malignancy and, uh, and the blood urea nitrogen. So, there is a mo modified scale which you can use uh, as ophthalmologist if you come across uh, acute SJS, then it is much more handy because the investigations might not be available. So, age again is an important prognostic factor as you can see, the higher the age, the higher the weightage, then the extent of involvement and the presence of underlying malignancy. So, then you have seen the patient, you have established the diagnosis of SASTN, you have prognosticated the patient, then what next to do is to find the culprit. So, most often 90 percent of adult SJS and TN are because of drugs. It is, the, it is the story is also true in pediatric patients, but 10 to 15 percent of pediatric patients might have SJS TN because of infection. The most likely infection in them is herpes simplex virus and mycoplasma. And there are other possible tri triggers. Not everyone who is put on, on a medicine would develop SJS TN. There is definite genetic association as my previous speaker spoke. There is a definite uh, uh, correlation between HLA predisposition and development of SJS TN. Other than that, there are other trigger factors which, which could have triggered SJSTN in, in, in a given patient. So, any patient who has an associated connective tissue disease, especially SLE, has an increased odds of developing SJSTN. Underlying HIV infection, especially for nevirapine associated SJS, is quite common in HIV, and HIV itself predisposes such patients to develop SJS. The odds ratio is 8. Underlying malignancy 
and acute kidney injury because they will not be able to uh, uh, clear the drug metabolites. Then most often, at least in my practice, when patients come, they are all on polypharmacy. They are generally elderly, they will be on 10 to 15 drugs, they have underlying malignancy, they will be undergoing chemotherapy, they will have renal failure. In such a situation, it is difficult to, difficult to isolate the drug which is most likely would have triggered, triggered SJSTN in them. Isolating the drug, with, drug which has caused the drug rash is important because you need to avoid the, the similar or the cross-reacting drug which would exacerbate the condition if given. So what we follow is known as an ALDIN algorithm. This is, this is the widely validated uh, algorithm for, for drug causation. So it has many points in it. The first important criteria is delay from initial drug. As how long after the drug intake did the rash develop? So most likely in SJSTN, the drug rash develops from in an interval of 5 to 20, 28 days. This is unlike DRUS, which is again a drug rash, which develops after an interval of 4 weeks. So any patient who has developed a drug rash in this, drug, in this interval of 5 to 28, 28 days, is likely to have SJSTN and scores a score of 3. Then what, what you have to see is the half-life of the drug. If, if a patient develops the drug rash after it has been cleared from the body, it is unlikely to have caused the rash. So if, if the rash develops within the half-life of the drug, then it is the likely culprit. Then again, you can challenge, this is after, after the rashes, acute rashes subsided, you can do a challenge or a de-challenge test. But it, for, in, in, it can be done in erythema multiforme, it can be done in fixed drug eruption, but it is generally not indicated in, in SJSTN spectrum because it is life-threatening and you just don't want to induce a rash again. So then you add these scores and a patient who has a score of more than 6, the, a drug which has a score of more than 6 is likely to have precipitated the drug rash. Then as discussed before, the age is an important prognostic factor and pre-existing comorbidities like malignancy and kidney injuries are, are important prognostic factors. And in, during inpatient, they are likely to develop certain complications. The, more, the most likely complications they, are, they can develop during inpatient, especially in an Indian setting, is septicemia. Most often these patients are left, referred late to us. They come invariably after 24 to 48 hours. They, have, they would have used indigenous medications. They would not have practiced barrier caring. So they invariably present with septicemia. The, and again, there is the, uh, uh, the SCS 10 disease spectrum just does not involve the oral mucosa. There is sloughing of the bronchial epithelium also. Respiratory mucosa is also involved. So they generally have pneumonia because of, uh, because of, because of uh, the sloughing of the bronchial epithelium. And they are likely to go to uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome also. ARDS is also common in such patients and they might require ventilatory support. And since they are bedridden, elderly, with various comorbidities, including uh, malignancy, they are at high risk of DVT. And again, uh, giving uh, heparin prophylaxis to prevent DVT is, is a double-edged sword. Because they, have, they invariably have uh, peeling of the skin, so they have raw surface, you give heparin and they invariably bleed from there. And they, have, uh, uh, they, are, they are anemic also because they will be losing blood from from the skin, from the gut, and then again you put them on heparin, they'll start losing blood from the, from the raw surface also. And because of dehydration, because they come to us late, they are not well hydrated, they invariably have uh, pre-renal acetemia, they might also progress on to develop acet uh, acute tubular necrosis. So once you have prognosticated the patient, evaluated his general status, uh, you have to treat him. So the most widely accepted treatment is supportive care. This is, this is the most widely accepted treatment. We told all likely culprit drugs and don't give any drug in acute stage until and unless it is necessary. So any drug, even paracetamol can, can cause a drug rash. So until, unless it is necessary, don't give any drug. Don't give blanket antibiotics until and unless the patient is in sepsis and you have conclusively ruled out cross-reacting drug or similar drug as an implicating agent. Avoid use of any cross-reacting drugs. So if a patient has uh, SCSTN because of phenytoin, 
you have to know which are the drugs which, which cross react with phenytoin. So drugs which cross react with phenytoin like carbamazepine, lamotrigine and sodium valproate should be avoided and, and drugs from other groups should be supplemented. And supportive care again is the most universally accepted intervention. Bar barrier nursing is very important in such patients because the skin is peeling, the more you handle the patient, the more the skin peels. So minimal handling of the patient, barrier dressing and asepsis are the cornerstone, of man cornerstone in the management of acute SJS. And the necrotic skin, so especially if the patient is in a, is in a burn setting or if a surgeon is, uh, uh, is taking care of the patient, especially this is what happens in US, they invariably debride the skin. So this is not a good practice because skin acts as a natural dressing. So if the, if the patient has skin and if it has not eroded, leave the skin like that. Don't, don't peel off the skin. And the patient with, and patients who have raw areas, dress them up with Vaseline impregnated wraps. It, it is not costly. It can be uh, made, made in your own institution, autoclaved and then used. Air, use of air mattress to prevent uh, bed sores and to prevent peeling of the necrotic skin is impro important. Appropriate antibiotics should be given only if it is indicated. If the patient has sepsis, if the patient has bacterial pneumonia, you can add antibiotics depending on your institutional practice and culture sensitivity report, but blanket antibiotic coverage is, is not necessary and it is not recommended also. Fluid support is important. You give fluids at a rate of 0.7 ml per kg. Generally, what we use, what we give, what we use is a normal saline, and you have to titrate it to have an urine output of 0.5 to 1 ml per kg per hour. These patients are pre, are predisposed to hypothermia, especially in, in such an environment. So temperature regulation, nursing the patients in humid in environment is necessary. Enteric nutrition, which is of high protein diet, is important. So this is the most controversial uh, topic, whether to put the patient on any immunosuppressants or not. So these are the list of immunosuppressants which are mostly used to treat, uh, treat patients of SJSTN. Corticosteroid, either oral high-dose corticosteroid or in pulsed formulation. IVIG high-dose because low-dose IVIG doesn't work. Cyclosporine at a dose of 3 to 5 milligram, TNF-alpha inhibitors and thalidomide. There is, there is conclusive evidence that thalidomide does not work. Thalidomide is associated with increased risk and increased mortality, so it is no longer used. TNF-alpha inhibit alpha blockers, uh, the, the data on use of TNF-alpha blockers are limited, although few case reports and case series show increasing uh, results with TNF-alpha blockers, but uh, large data and long-term outcome uh, are lacking, so no conclusive uh, 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 thing can be established with uh, TNF-alpha blockers. And corticosteroids, there is a lot of uh, controversy surrounding the use of corticosteroids. Uh, in early 2000 or even until 2008, uh, in our institutional practice was to use corticosteroids. So we generally used to start the patients on, on prednisolone at a dose of 1 milligram per kg body weight. In some patients, we also used to give high-dose dexamethasone pulse. But uh, the current evidence shows that uh, use of corticosteroids is associated with, there are certain reports which shows that use of corticosteroids is associated with poor outcome, higher mortality, and there are two meta-analyses currently which does not support the use of corticosteroids. Use of corticosteroids may, no, may not alter the final outcome or it can be harmful also. IVIG, IVIG came up in uh, late 2000s uh, in India at least, so from 2008 to 2015, we were treating our patients with, uh, with high dose IVIG. So again, the current meta-analysis and the current data shows that use of IVIG does not alter the long-term outcome or the acute uh, mortality in patients with SJS. So uh, IVIG is again uh, not used as of now in my current practice. So how we treat acute SJS is with systemic cyclosporine. So we use uh, cyclosporine in a dose of 3 to 5 milligram. Generally, we give, give it for 10 to 15 days. We monitor the disease activity. We see if the perilesional erythema is persisting, if the erythema is, is subsiding, if the skin is reepithelizing. And after 10 to 15 days, we can abrupt, abruptly stop cyclosporine. So this was the, one of the uh, first papers which came out on use of cyclosporine to treat uh, Steven Johnson syndrome. So it was, a patient, it was a case series of 45 patients and the authors reported good outcome with use of cyclosporine. 
So this is the most recent meta-analysis on uh, treatment outcomes in acute phase of SJSTN and uh, this meta-analysis data clearly clearly tells that uh, cyclosporine and glucocorticoids were the most promising systemic immunomodulating therapies for SJS TN. So this is, this was one of my patients who was recently treated with uh, cyclosporine. This was on day one. So as you can see the patient has presented to us late. This is at least 70 to 3 to 4 days old. And even then we started the patient on cyclosporine and within three days there is re-epithelization and the perilesional erythema has subsided. Uh, these patients can present with long term, com term complications and this can also help as markers to diagnose TN and SJS in retrospect when the patient comes to an ophthalmologist with just ocular complaints and may not have acute skin symptoms. So these patients will have post-inflammatory hypo or hyperpigmentation which is known as dispigmentation. They have chronic pruritus, photosensitivity may or may not have hypertrophic scarring but invariably they will have nail and oral mucosal changes. So any patient you suspect to have to have had SJSTN examine their nails and examine their oral mucosa. So nail changes in the, in the form of onychomedesis, nail dystrophy, longitudinal ridging, if they are present then they, it is likely that the patient had SJS. Examine their oral mucosa, if the oral mucosa is, is bald, if there is lack of papillae, if there is persisting erythema, these are features of previous uh, subacute SJS. So this is the patient which I had treated with cyclosporine. So it is her recent follow-up after two months. You can see the skin has epithelized, but there is pigmentary disturbance. There is post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Again, the hemorrhagic resting has subsided, but there are nail changes. There is onychomedesis, there is nail dystrophy, and again, there are ocular symptoms. So if the patient presents to you in this symptoms, in this stage, you can examine her skin, there would be pigmentary disturbances, there would be nail disturbances, there would be oral mucosal findings. So in retrospect, again, you can suspect or you can diagnose SASTN. So the take-home messages are, if there are atypical target odd lesions, if there is hemorrhagic crusting of the lips and ocular congestions and diffuse erythema of skin, these are the clinical pointers towards SASTN. The differentials in children include mycoplasma-associated mucositis, Staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome and Kawasaki disease. In adults, it is toxic shock syndrome and immunobullous disease. Other drug rashes like fixed drug eruption and drug rash eosinophilia and systemic symptoms can mimic SJSTN. It is important to prognosticate these patients, do score 10 on day 1 and 3, identify the culprit, culprit drug, follow the ALDEN algorithm, supportive care and barrier nursing is the corner store in management. And if you have to use an immunosuppressant, cyclosporine is the drug of choice. Thank you. Dr. Vinay, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure uh, all of us were really looking forward to it. It's not every day that we as ophthalmologists do get to interact with a dermatologist and see all these uh, differential diagnoses. Uh, I'm sure all of us uh, have questions ready. Uh, yeah, sure. Dr. Chodosh, please. So uh, I asked this earlier, do you have, yeah. uh, can you comment on the difference clinically between mycoplasma mucositis and mycoplasma induced Stevens-Johnson syndrome and how, how we understand that difference? Uh, so it is about what's in the name. I think it's the same. So mycoplasma can again induce the whole spectrum. It can induce erythema multiformitis. It can induce Stevens-Johnson syndrome. When it is uh, mycoplasma induced erythema multiforme, you can just have severe mucositis involving the eyes and the oral mucosa with sparing of the skin. When it progresses to Steven Johnson syndrome, there will be skin involvement. So it's the same. So there are dermatologists, and you may know them, who really believe that there are different disorders, that mycoplasma mucositis is an infectious disorder and, and not really a, an immune disorder in the same way uh, that mycoplasma induced SJS might be. Yes, uh, uh, the pathogenesis is different in mycoplasma induced SJS and drug drug induced SJS, but uh, the management also differs because if you suspect mycoplasma induced uh, mucositis and pneumonia, then you will have to treat mycop associated mycoplasma also. Uh, 
So uh, when you suspect mycoplasma as the probable cause, uh, morphologically there are differences which suggest that it can be mycoplasma associated. If, if you have a typical erythema, typical target lesion, that is the photo on the right, and especially if it is if it is if it is surrounded by a string of small pearls, what we call clinically as Bateman's purpura, it is a marker towards mycoplasma induced Steven Johnson syndrome. If it is if there is severe mucositis with minimal involvement of the skin, again you suspect mycoplasma as a possible trigger. Now mycoplasma PCR is available, so we do mycoplasma PCR especially in children who present with severe mucositis without any skin lesion. When you strongly suspect mycoplasma as the etiological factors, and we do have many patients who turn out to be positive. That leads me to next question, then I'll stop. So, when would you test? What what are the clinical signs then? in any patient with mucositis and skin rash to make when, a test for mycoplasma. Yeah, uh, I know it's more common in children, but. So when, when you are suspecting drug as a possible trigger, it is always necessary to, to establish a temporal association between the drug intake and the association of drug rash. So most often the patient says that uh, they had some headache, they took the drug, and after the drug they became worse. So if a patient presents a, with a history that they had already choresa, they had mucosal erosions, and then they went to a, a primary care physician and they took the drug, then probably drug is not the culprit in, in them. So when there is no history of drug intake, or if the drug has been taken after the onset of symptoms, then you will have to look for an alternative trigger where mycoplasma is high on the list. And certain morphology, which I said, if the patient has Bateman's purpura, if the patient has severe mucositis, especially in children, you suspect mycoplasma as possible trigger. So it is all about uh, the establishing the temporal uh, association of drug intake and, and the rash. If there is a clear-cut history, a patient took antiepileptic, patient took certain antibiotic, and then he or she developed a rash, then you are quite certain that it is drug-induced. You need not have to evaluate further. Can I ask you a question? Doc, uh, yeah. is there a, uh, what is the difference between virus uh, induced SJS versus drug induced SJS? Uh, is there the, a difference? The pathogenesis of this drug rash is actually changing, uh, especially if you see the dress spectrum, drug rash, eosinophilia, and systemic symptoms. For that to be caused, there should be both virus and the drug to be present in the body at the same time. And similarly in SJS, we are currently not aware if a herpes simplex virus or cytomegalovirus is also a co-culprit in causing a drug rash because uh, as my previous speaker spoke, there is a definite HLA association between uh, SJS, TN and intake of carbamazepine or phenytoin. But not all patients who have such HLA predisposition develop drug rash. So I did uh, mention in my table that there are other trigger factors like associated connective tissue disease, associated HIV, and we are not sure at this point of time if, if, if viral infection also predisposes a patient to develop SJSTN when they develop, when they take a particular drug. So it is likely that herpes, and, herpes simplex virus and cytomegalovirus may, might be triggering the onset of SJS in, in such patients because it is established that they do trigger dress in patients who develop drugs. Because in the SCAR study published like in 90s, late 90s, uh, there, there was a mention about, uh, there, there is a clear distinction uh, between the virus induced versus the drug induced uh, Steven Johnson. So, but that's a very old uh, data. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think both of, both the diseases converge at one converge. point. But do you feel that their presentation and ultimate prognosis of these two varieties is different? Uh, drug induced versus uh, which does have a drug and uh, maybe an, a virus induced as Dr. Sangha mentioned. Uh, this uh, this uh, viral induced uh, uh, drug uh, SJSTN mostly have predominant mucositis. They have minimal skin involvement. So at least from the dermatological perspective, their outcome is good. <laughs> But uh, again, from an ophthalmological perspective, it might be bad. And another question is, you showed a few patients of fixed drug eruptions. Yes. So, so do you feel that at some point of time when they take this drug again and that, no. that no. can convert into... So fixed drug eruption and SJS are completely different uh, sets of drug rash. They have different pathogenesis. Patients of FD will go on to develop more FDs 
There might be severe skin involvement, but they'll never develop SDS. So my question is about use of uh, my question is about use of cyclosporin. Uh, we know that cyclosporin works by preventing activation of T lymphocytes. Yes. But the ones that are already activated have a half life, have a mean life of around 60 to 120 days. So cyclosporin does not have an effect on those. So how can cyclosporin work in such an acute setting? Uh, I didn't get that. T cells have it. Can you repeat the question, please? The T cells, which are already recruited and which are causing the damage, mm -hmm. they will be in the system for around 60 days. Uh, here, w it is necessary to know the half-life of the drug. Like for a drug like allopurinol, which has a long half-life, the, uh, the drug can persist in the circulation for nearly 28 to 30 days. So these patients will go on to have progressive SJSTN. So the patient might present to you at the stage of Steven that, Johnson syndrome. That's not his question. He's asking how can cyclosporin work if, it, if, it, if the T cells that are already activated have such a long uh, life in the body. He's asking for mechanism of action of cyclosporin. So cyclosporin basically inhibits uh, T cell activation. So activated T cells, how the, uh, cyclosporin also prevents in activation of further T cells. You know, if, if the drug is there in the circulation, they would keep on activating the T cells. So the drug is there in the circulation until the half-life of it is reached and it is eliminated. So why I'm not sure uh, if like how, how like it acts on like the you activated T cells. You showed an image in which there is re-epithelization in 72 hours. So uh, how can cyclosporin work so fast? No, no, no. Uh, here the re-epithelization is because of the stem cells which are there in the dermis. So if you take, take away the acute insult, the skin will re-epithelize. So if, if you have a wound, if you for have a trauma and if you have a wound, the re-epithelization generally starts within 72 hours because there is proliferation of the dermal stem cells, they differentiate and they uh, lay down collagen and there is epidermal uh, pro proliferation and the wound yields. So if there is ongoing insult, if the SJSTN disease spectrum is continuing, then, the, uh, then there is ongoing necrosis, the skin will not re-epithelize. Whereas if you give cyclosporin, it would put an halt on the ongoing inflammation, the necrosis won't progress, so it gives time for the skin to heal back. But Vinay, the, the dogma is that cyclosporin takes six weeks to work in disease, so we're stuck with that. And so a lot of people have asked this question, as how can a cyclosporin, uh, again, I'm not doubting the study, but the mechanism, how can cyclosporin given acutely have an it almost immediate effect when the teaching is that it takes six weeks to see an effect of cyclosporin when we give it So probably the, the whatever you are telling is from the transplant data, but in, ac in acute SJSTN, we don't even give the drug for more than 10, 15 days. I so the drug is not even there in the circulation at six weeks. The mechanism has still not been not clearly not elucidated. Yeah. Uh, do we have relative sparing of the scalp in SJS? Hello. Uh, Dr. Vinay? Yeah. yeah. Do we have relative sparing of the scalp in SJS? Uh, scalp is a thick tissue. So generally for peeling of the skin to occur, uh, the peeling is more prominent in pressure areas. So there is, there is sparing of the scalp. But there is involvement of the hair. There is increased hair shedding. There is anagen effluvium. Patient might go bald. But erosions are generally not seen over the scalp because it's a very compact issue. Once the patient has come in the chronic stage and now systemically who otherwise looks fine, is there a reason to uh, refer back the patient to the rheumatologist or the physician? I mean, are there any systemic implications for SGS later? They look fine otherwise in the chronic so stage. So it is important to give the patient the list of uh, the suspected drugs and the list of cross-reacting drugs so that he or she uh, would carry it whenever he, uh, they go to a physician and they don't take that drug. So prevention is important and also as I told uh, in my, uh, as, as I showed in my last photograph, these patients are likely to have long-term cutaneous complications. Like the, uh, in, in SJSTN they have, they are likely to have dispigmentation, they are less likely to have, they are more likely to have pruritus they have uh, disturbances in their sweating, then uh, they have photosensitivity. So these are uh, the complications which should be taken care of during their follow-up visits. when they develop or they can be prevented by pre-referring them to the dermatologist or... So as and when they develop, you, okay. ca you can refer the patient. So good afternoon. 
I'm an oculoplastic surgeon. That was an extremely lucid talk. Uh, so I just want you to know, you mentioned that from the late 2000s for a couple of years, IVIG was given where cost was probably not an issue. Have you gone back and compared in the acute phase if there is any difference between the cohort that received IVIG compared to the ones which now just receive cyclosporin? Uh, we have not done a systemic comparison between the previous cohort and the current cohort because we are using cyclosporin since only past two years. Okay. So our data on cyclosporin is not that huge to, com to, to do a comparison. Okay, yeah, thanks. But at least in by clinical practice, I can tell that cyclosporin definitely works much better than what IVIG used to work. Okay. Uh, Dr. Vinay, uh, as you showed, atypical lesions are generally characteristic of uh, SJS. Uh, during day four or day five, I think the sin starts peeling off, day three, day four. And uh, as you showed in one of your slides when the patient presenting late to you and the skin was already peeled off, does the erythema persist? And if not, then how do you diagnose a patient who comes later to you? Say day uh, the erythema is again dependent on the half-life of the drug. So if the culprit drug is something like allopurinol, you might have erythema even till two weeks. Uh, if the if the half-life of the drug is very short, then the drug is no longer there in the circulation, the erythema might not be present. So there is again a controversy at this point if you have to use an immunosuppressant in such patients or not because there is no inflammation, the drug has been cleared. So we are not sure if we have to treat them with uh, cyclosporine or we have to just give supportive treatment. But coming back to your question, these patients have purpuric macules. So there are two morphologies to diagnose SGS. One is... Uh, uh, a typical target odd lesion, the second is purpuric macules. So even the patient who presented on day four had purpuric macules. So, so that would be present even till uh, week two and, you know, until the skin peels and new skin comes, it would be there. So is there any role of skin biopsy uh, for confirmatory diagnosis or that is mostly for academic purposes? Uh, we don't practice. So there is, the, it is a clinical diagnosis. Most often you can establish a diagnosis of SJS on clinical examination. So it is just of academic interest to get get a skin biopsy, especially if you are in doubt, if you are not able to uh, differentiate uh, bullous FTE, generalized bullous FTE with, uh, with toxic epidermal necrolysis, toxic shock syndrome with toxic epidermal necrolysis, then you can go for a frozen section examination. The reports would be immediately available. If there is pandermal necrosis, then it is SJSTN. If it is not, then it, uh, you can think of other differentials. Okay. And I think in children, especially at times it is difficult to differentiate staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome and SJSTN because the management differs. So in one you have to give antibiotics, in other you need not have to. There again skin frozen section examination would be of help. Alright, uh, if you have any further questions, uh, I think uh, that would be it. Thank you Dr. Vinay, thank you very much. Thank you. And. Uh, <laughs>um, I, I see a lot of these patients uh, largely because of where I work. I, I work in Denver where the red arrow is, and a lot of you may have seen this slide before, but it still kind of tells the story that the only burn center that we have closest to us is, is, shows, is shown on the red oval. So it's hundreds and hundreds of miles from Denver to the next closest burn center. So we see all these people from, uh, from a large region, and so I've I've taken care of all of those patients that come to our burn center over the, over the last decade or more. And uh, we started treating them with amniotic membrane about, I guess, in 2005 or early 2006, we did our first case. You guys, we've already discussed sort of the aspects of the disease. But the couple things to notice in the slides here, let's see, is my mouse? No, the mouse doesn't show up up there, it looks like. Um, these are two different patients, even though they look very similar. They're both girls that are about 10 or 12 years old. And you can see the difference. The top girl has Steven Johnson syndrome, a lot of mucositis. Uh, the eyes are severely involved. 
but not much on the shoulders. You can see the difference. Whereas the girl on the bottom has has ten, and she's sloughing all of her skin like like a scalded tomato almost. And so that, but even so, despite the skin involvement, the eye involvement often doesn't correlate. So it's very important to examine these patients in the acute phase. This just shows a few photos, kind of of the increasing severity of the skin manifestations which you're kind of familiar with. And it can become you know, quite difficult to just get a good eye exam uh, when they're all bandaged up and they have serosanguinous debris everywhere. And sometimes they're bundled up like a mummy uh, with the bandaging, and I, that can be difficult. You know, and the complications we have been discussed at length, you know, the, the eyelash and the mucosal problems, and certainly the stem cell deficiency that can lead to corneal blindness is a particular problem. And the, the visual problems that they suffer are particularly cruel because they're, they're incredibly light sensitive. So it's very debilitating, and you guys know that well. We used to, I, for the first year or two that I was seeing these patients, we did all the standard treatments that the textbooks recommend, uh, doing you know, some rinsing of the eyes, looking for symblepharon, sweeping, trying to prevent symblepharon formation. And this is a patient I've mentioned to a couple of you guys whose wife suggested to me that we should try amniotic membrane. I think it was in probably early 2005. And we had done everything that we were supposed to on this patient, but he still developed significant meibomian gland problems. You can see these are not, these are not happy looking lid margins. He had some keratinization of the, of the posterior lid margin and just uh, really poor lid, uh, meibomian gland function. And he ended up doing okay with scleral lenses, but he's very dependent on the scleral lenses, uh, which, you know, as he he's, was in his 30s at the time. So who knows what his life's going to be like in 50 years. So I started thinking about what, you know, what can we do to try and prevent the symblepharon at the start? What's causing the symblepharon to form and the inflammation? And that's where the amniotic membrane has, has been a real difference maker. Um, you guys are familiar with the amniotic membrane. It was, it was first described in Stephen Johnson, two case reports uh, in 2002. And then there was one other case report describing a technique that we sort of adopted uh, that came out in, in 2005. And I went through the video yesterday. Basically, we, we apply the membrane to, separately to the backs of the eyelids and then cover the surface either with the procara, uh, if the bulbar conjunctival sloughing is, is not extensive, or we cover the whole surface with a sheet of amniotic membrane. Uh, it's a bit labor intensive and it uh, we, you know, requires ideally an operating microscope and we take them to the operating room. I'm encouraged to see the developments with the, uh, the conformers and as well as the amniotic membrane inserter, the amserter uh, that's being developed because hopefully it will allow uh, doctors who don't see it as often to do it in a, without it being so difficult to arrange for the care. And hopefully in India will allow more of the patients to be treated in the acute phase because the, as you'll see as we go through this, the, the slides here, using the amniotic membrane in the first week of the disease has almost completely prevented the catastrophic problems uh, that so many of the presentations have been on at the conference here. Uh, it doesn't prevent every single problem with dry eye, but they're manageable problems and they're not debilitating, life-changing troubles. So postoperatively, when we do apply the amniotic membrane, uh, we, we either have a Procara ring on, which provides a symblepharon ring effect, or we place a symblepharon ring on the eye. They're on some anti-inflammatory drops and some antibiotic. I mentioned yesterday it's very important to keep the portion on the lid margins moist we use a combination antibiotic steroid ointment. I instruct the nursing staff on how to use it, tell them, stress to them how important it is uh, because they're very busy with all the other medical needs that the patient has. But they need to understand how important it is for them to do this, this simple thing. And we rinse them every day and we watch them. You know, we watch them early on to see how they're progressing and we watch them each day afterwards to make sure the membranes are intact. We rinse away all the debris that builds up, and I think that that's really important as well. These are the first five patients that we treated with amniotic membrane. And uh, on the left side of the, of the photos, you see their preoperative uh, appearance. 
And then the slides down the right column are the same patients showing them six months later. So pre-op and then six months later. And also just showing their visual outcomes and the severity of their dry eye problems. So the visual outcomes were, were good. Uh, and the dry eye problems are, if they have any dry eye problems, they're very manageable. And this is the next five patients. Similarly, you know, kind of very inflamed, angry looking eyes on the left, and then quiet, pretty happy eyes afterwards. So, you know, our work that we've published, as well as Namrata Sharma, had a randomized control study, and there are multiple other case series that have been uh, in prominent journals establishing that the treatment's effective, right? So, I don't think that's a question anymore. Because does everybody need the treatment? And so the sloughing is, is the key. And I just use a fluorescein strip. It's, it's easy to do. Whether you call it erythema multiforme major, TEN, SJS, I don't care. <laughs> it, you know, that's, that's not my issue. If there's extensive sloughing on the lid margins and the bulbar surfaces, or the conjunctival surfaces of the eye, then I, I treat them with amniotic membrane because those areas tend to heal in more with the abnormal thickened scar tissue that doesn't produce the normal mucin and tears you know, that the eye needs. So we developed a classification system to kind of show uh, you know, what cases are severe, when is it worrisome, and also hopefully you know, as there's more research done on the acute phase to provide a framework so that in studies we're comparing similar patient populations. So and I'll walk through these, each of these uh, categories in a little more detail. You know, mild is just some hyperemia of the conjunctiva. There's generally not any sloughing. And those are patients that we kind of monitor closely. Uh, we may do some medical treatment with the drops, uh, but they don't generally need amniotic membrane at all. Moderate is a little more extensive sloughing, usually a small portion of the lid margin, kind of a discrete, very identifiable uh, portion of the bulbar conjunctiva that stains and it tends not to be progressive. So we watch them closely. If they're not progressing, these patients will generally do fine. And I sort of arbitrarily chose a diameter of about one centimeter, that if it gets larger than that, I start to worry more. Sort of thinking back to pterygium surgery, if, when we do a conjunctival autograph, we take off around a centimeter-sized portion for the graft, and it, and it heals in fine. So I think if you have enough normal conjunctiva surrounding the small defects, it's, it provides tissue to heal it in. If the, if the sloughing becomes too extensive, you, d you don't have enough normal tissue to keep up with the healing needs, and that's where the body, I think, tends to respond, producing more of a scar tissue. So when you get into the severe categories, you can just see on the backs of the eyelids, along the lid margin, there's extensive sloughing. And Jim had mentioned in his talk, this is the picture on the right, is one of the eyes of a child who, really all of these photos, if you look, they haven't received dilating drops, phenylephrine. Uh, so the bulbar conjunctiva is relatively spared in some of these patients, and it's quiet. So if you just glanced at them with a pen light and didn't stain them, and you didn't specifically pull the eyelid down and look at the palpebral conjunctiva, you might say, oh, this patient's doing okay because they're often intubated, sedated, they can't tell you that their eye's hurting. Um, so it's really crucial to stain them and look. So these are patients where we would do urgent amniotic membrane grafting to the eyelids, the lid margin, and the palpebral conjunctiva. These are ones where we would probably just place a Procara on the globe. And doing that procedure can certainly be done at the bedside. I prefer to go to the operating room because it's, it's more comfortable for me. Um, and I think I can do a better job with the microscope, but you could do it at the bedside. Um, but these patients generally will do well with just a Procara. We start getting into sort of the difference between what's severe bulbar conjunctival staining versus uh, the moderate. It's a matter of degree. You can see in the photos here, they show more extensive areas. It's little, the borders are a little less clear. Where does it the lesion actually really stop and where does it extend to? They may start to form some blepharon. Um, you can see the one I was calling moderate, the, the difference. It's just it's a smaller, less extensive area of involvement. 
Then you start getting into what I call extremely severe, where there's sloughing everywhere. It may involve the cornea, large areas of the bulbar cons, the lid margins, the palpebral conge. And the treatment here is the same, except that we're a little more prone to covering the surface of the eye with a sheet of the amniotic membrane. And I usually will advise the patient or their family that there's a good chance that we may need to do this again in a week or so. So they already have it in their head that we may be doing it once more, sometimes twice more, although that's not as common anymore. So once you've done it, the membranes last around a week or so, and then they start to degrade and look kind of junky and probably aren't doing a whole lot of good. And so that people ask me, well, when, how do you decide when to treat again? And that's a little bit less clearly defined. But when I see eyes, you know, after a week to 10 days and they still look like this, then I, I'm a little bit worried. Some of that subconjunctival hemorrhage, but the lid margins are just kind of thick and ratty looking. Uh, the eye still looks kind of inflamed. You know, similar picture here. If the eye is already looking quieter and settling down, then we, we won't repeat it. But these are eyes that we did do repeat uh, membrane on. So. You know, as far as the treatment with amniotic membrane, it's, it helps prevent the disasters, you know, consistently. Now, the timing's important, though, and we've learned that, that the first week is really important. And I, I say this, a lot of you have heard this, but it, you need a sense of urgency. I joke that it's like a parachute. You know, parachutes are really great at preventing death from falling out of airplanes, but not if you wait too long. So if you don't use it early, you may think that the amniotic membrane doesn't work but you need to do it early. And we, we analyzed our data with patients. And the key thing in, this, in these charts is the, the relative risk of patients that were treated more than six days into their illness had a three times greater risk of having moderate to severe dry eye problems, almost a six times risk of having decreased vision. Now the decreased vision in these patients was not catastrophic. It, we used 20-30, so 6-9 vision as our cutoff for a decrease in vision. They also had a seven and a half times greater risk of having tarsal scarring, moderate tarsal scarring. And, you know, and the other speakers have established you know, that that's a, that's a big problem and can lead to slow long-term um, morbidity of the eye. So if you're thinking of doing it, do it early. Don't sit on it for a few days and say, oh, we'll check it next week and see how it looks. You don't need a lot of fancy tools to, to do these exams. You know, I have a fluorescein strip I use a, an off the, a handheld ophthalmoscope that has a blue light on it so I can see my fluorescein. I'm no good with a scleral depressor for looking at the retina anymore, so I use them to sweep for uh, symblepharon. And just something to rinse the eye, just some sterile saline to give the eye a good rinse each day to get rid of the debris so that you can actually see what's going on as well. I've already mentioned this, this child, but he, was, he, he may have had erythema multiforme major because he just had some blistering uh, on his hands and feet, but he had really extensive mucositis in his mouth to the point where he couldn't eat. He was having breathing trouble. So he was on a feeding tube and intubated. And so he couldn't tell you if his eyes were bothering him, but you can see that he had extensive sloughing. Uh, and that both eyes looked that way. And so if you just looked at him without examining the eyes with fluorescein, you wouldn't know. And I worry a lot if the mouth is severely involved, I worry that the eyes are going to be similarly affected, so it should clue you in to be more concerned. doesn't always hold, but a good majority of the time, the mouth and the eyes behave similarly. So we've learned that early interventions are important. We've learned to educate our hospital staff, not only to consult us immediately, we're part of the, basically part of the admission process for these patients. We keep the amniotic membrane in stock at our hospital, so it's there ready to use. If we're not sure, we'll treat them. There's not much downside to doing that. For other doctors who may not be as comfortable or as familiar and have the availability of the treatment, at least certainly in the United States, I tell them to be aware of who can do it because you need to be able to refer these people to someone who can do the treatment. In severe cases, you might have to do it more than once. It's important to treat the lids. You know, in the meibomian gland disease, I think is a problem. So I, if we're repeating the membrane application, we'll vi kind of pretty vigorously do manual expression of the meibomian glands to clean the junk out that builds up. Because uh, I think the combination of the debris on their lids, the amniotic membrane itself tends to block the meibomian orifices, and the fact that they're often sedated in the ICU and not blinking for weeks 
all causes stuff to build up in the amniotic, in the meibomian glands. And you've got to clear that out or else the glands are going to get destroyed. And that will lead to the more progressive chronic dry eye problems. So you Hispanic woman, so darker pigmented skin, had a very severe case. Uh, came to our hospital three days after her symptoms began. And you can see some of the concerning features is just the whitening of the eyelid margin. That's, that's necrotic tissue. And basically her entire ocular surface sloughed off. Uh, not so much on the cornea, but all of the bulbar surfaces just peeled off in sheets uh, when we went to the operating room. And we, she's one, as Jim mentioned, you know, that we saw her in the morning. I went back because I was nervous and saw her that afternoon and she was already uh, sloughing more skin and her eyes were a mess. So we ended up doing her I can't remember if it was either that evening or early the next day. Um, covered her up. Ten days later, you know, she was a big mess. Uh, we repeated the amniotic membrane. Ten days after that, we took her back to the operating room thinking we would redo her lids once more. Uh, and put the lid speculum in and got a closer look. And you can see beyond the air, there's a little whitish area, uh, which is always concerning because the amniotic membrane was gone. It wasn't just a little thickening of the membrane. And it's stained with fluorescein. So we ended up, we cultured her. Now we started her on fortified antibiotics. Uh, the cultures ended up growing yeast. Uh, it was a, kind of a rare yeast called Blastoschizomyces capitatus, which uh, was a, had only been described once in the literature. So we, we started her on the same treatment that the one case report had described as being successful. So we had her on amphotericin and natamycin drops, and we put her on systemic fluconazole. This was about 10 years ago. We might have used voriconazole uh, these days. Uh, and she seemed to be thinning, so we glued her early on. The glue only lasted a couple days and came off, and we glued her again. Uh, about three weeks later, uh, the second round of gluing came off, uh, but she hadn't healed. Uh, she, the depression that you can see on the top uh, was still staining. So I was trying to figure out what to do to help it heal. I ended up doing a little rotational. Because it was peripheral, I did a, tried a little conjunctival flap to cover it, uh, which necrosed. And then she developed a new infiltrate, uh, which ended up growing uh, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, which that ended up clearing with uh, a week or so of vancomycin drops. Uh, but she still wasn't healed. So I did multilayered amniotic membrane grafting little pancakes into the the depression there, and that actually worked, and she healed. Um, you can see the right eye was, was pretty happy with a good tear film. The left eye had some irregularities, uh, but not staining, just some pooling in the depression. And she ended up uh, seeing 2030 in that eye with a prose lens. She had about three and a half diopters of irregular astigmatism uh, due to the thinning that you can see there inferiorly. But it was a lot of work, um, and she was in our hospital for nearly two months. Uh, while we took care of all that. So it just shows a lot of the, we used almost all the different treatment modalities that have been discussed here to try and get her to heal, especially yesterday when we were talking about how to, to deal with these corneas that have a persistent defect. So this was another, another tough case. She was a 62-year-old woman. She lived about eight hours away from Denver, where I work. And she was, initially I got a call from her ophthalmologist who had seen her up there about a week into her illness. She was in the hospital uh, in the small town where she lived. And he had put on Procaris, and I give him credit for at least thinking of that. Uh, but then a couple weeks later, he called and said, oh, she's, she's gotten much worse. She looks a lot more inflamed. She was about a, almost a month into the illness at that point. She ended up being flown to Denver. Uh, and we did amniotic membrane grafting of the whole surface. I wasn't sure if it would do any good because she was kind of beyond the, the time frame where we would normally do it. Uh, then, unfortunately, about a month after we did that, I got another call from her doctor. And he, she said she had a five millimeter ulcer on the right eye, the central, that was about to perforate. The left eye also had a central ulcer that was thinning. So my heart sank. I was kind of scared, trying to figure out what we were going to do with this. She ended up returning to Denver. We admitted her to our hospital. We cultured both eyes, which didn't grow anything. 
I ended up putting uh, glue patches on both eyes and started her on fortified vancomycin and tobramycin. Uh, she's also started her on serum drops and she was on systemic fluconazole and doxycycline because uh, I, I just I didn't know what was going on. It looked like sterile melts. So a week after we put the glue on, the right glue patch stayed in place. The left glue was gone, but she hadn't, she hadn't healed yet. Uh, so we put a Procara on, which quickly dissolved. Then we put cyanoacrylate glue back on, and it came off after another couple days in the left eye. Um, so I was trying to figure out what to do at that point with the left eye. I ended up putting a, just a bandaged contact lens on and did a tarsorophy, and we watched her for five days. And the, the central ulcer was getting thinner and thinner, uh, getting close to, the, you know, close to perforating. So I was trying to think, OK, well, what do we do now? I'd used multilayered amniotic membrane on the patient I just described before her. And I thought, well, I'll try that. It worked there. Uh, but also consider gluing her again, doing a little conge flap, or having to do a lamellar or patch graft. Uh, so we did the multilayered amniotic membrane and a tarsorophy. Unfortunately, uh, six days later, all of the little membrane patches came off, and she had the desmetaseal that you can see there. Uh, the right eye, the glue patch, remained. So we ended up doing a manual uh, lamellar keratoplasty on her left eye. I uh, put a Procara on and uh, did a a uh, reversible tarsorophy in the immediate post-operative period. And a month later, she'd actually gone back home uh, to, her, to where she lived. Uh, the right eye's glue patch was still there. The left eye, unfortunately, developed an epithelial defect on the superior portion of the graft. Uh, she had a, a bandage lens placed and a tarsorophy. And I got her referred to, the, at that time, 10 years ago, there weren't very many satellite pros fitting centers around the country. So I got her urgently sent to Boston uh, to get a pros lens. The right glue patch was still there, six months, uh, at least six months into it now. Uh, the left eye, she had the urgent pros fitting. Six months after that, the left eye was doing well. The vision was poor, actually. She, had, she has a posterior staphyloma in the left eye that limited the vision. The right eye, the glue patch, came off and she was leaking. She had a microperforation. So we ended up doing an urgent transplant on her right eye, full thickness, uh, with the tarsorophy and Procara. She ended up getting fitted with a scleral lens. I ended up eventually removing the cataracts in both eyes. And she sees 2020, and she's now eight years out from all of this. She's still, she's 2020 in her right eye with her scleral lens, and the left eye. Uh, still limited, but uh, because of the retinal problems. So, cataracts. She's a both good eyes. outcome. With a, there's an awful lot and of work. And she's 2020, and she's and the final one. You know, this is an 18-month-old, had Down syndrome, lived about six hours from Denver, and also had Steven Johnson syndrome. So this kid's been drawn some unlucky hands in life, and we did amniotic membrane grafting twice. She's not on the and eyes. And the final one. And then you know, this is an 18 This was month about old, a month. Had Down after syndrome. All of that. He was still in the about hospital. Six hours from poor Denver. feeding and nutrition. And also had Steven Johnson syndrome. And I was trying so, to make out what, what's going on with this with this cornea because it, it didn't really look like a, a normal infiltrate. And I thought maybe we did it's amniotic membrane grafting twice. Uh, it's hard to really assess the eyes. And then you know, this it was, is an 18 was about month old. Difficult exam to say the least. Down syndrome. That he was still in the hospital. Six hours poor feeding. Initially started on fortified antibiotics. And I was trying to make out what was going on with this cornea. It didn't really look like a normal infiltrate. It wasn't really thinning. We did amniotic membrane grafting twice. Able to watch the final one. We did a couple things. This was about a month. Talked yesterday about how Down syndrome. That drug abuse. Little kids with autism and autism. They were trying to make out what's going on with this. So we put both arms fairly large epithelial to protect them from normal cells. And then we did actually remove the artery twice. We did a couple things. This was about a month. Talked yesterday about downsizing the drug abuse. We did culture this for the body. Little kids with autism and autism. They were trying to make out what's going on with this. So we put both arms fairly large epithelial to protect them from normal cells. And then we did actually. 
Membrane and serum. I'll do tarsorophes at times. We also can use, there's commercially available amniotic fluid drops in the United States now that uh, provide a lot of hopefully helpful growth factors and cytokines to help healing. You may do a pedicle flap. Uh, and you can use right. some right. 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 things if they're thinning. So if you do all these things, you can be a Steven Johnson superhero um, and knock out the disease. So I appreciate your time, and I'm around the rest of today and tomorrow if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Gregory. And those were some really challenging cases. I'm sure uh, we'll have a lot of questions uh, waiting for you. You had already shown your video on amniotic membrane grafting yesterday. Uh, good to see the results of amniotic membrane. But is there any uh, comparison, comparative group showing uh, what happens when you do amniotic membrane versus what happens when you don't do amniotic membrane? Uh, only, I think, Nam Namrata, yeah, her, her paper showed a clear, uh, clearly better outcomes when they were, had amniotic yeah. membrane. So you think amniotic membrane helps in terms of decreasing blood or ocular complications? Late margin keratinization? Uh, I, th I think it helps, it helps preserve probably your limbal stem cells. It helps minimize the, the tarsal conjunctival scarring. Uh, probably decreases the severity of uh, the eyelash follicle damage. So you don't see much dystichiasis or trichiasis. It, it, it helps everything except it's one weak link we talked a little bit uh, yesterday in the clinical portion, is probably the meibomian glands. I don't think that it helps preserve them as well. Um, so I think it's important to do some extra manual expression uh, to try and clear those out to give them a chance to recover afterwards. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. And I